So in this video, I'm going to look at the skill of designing an effective experiment. So part of the third paper, or the third unit of physics, is to do with carrying out experiments. So there's a lot of number of set practicals you have to do. But by the time you finish it, what you should also be able to do is design your own experiment. And this tends to be what the longer type questions on exam papers is very common for them to ask you to design an experiment to do something. And there's a few key things that need to be included in an effective experiment, and that's what this video is focused on. So the first thing you should be able to do is identify your variables, so your independent, dependent, control variable, that kind of thing. The next, you need to choose your equipment and also select a suitable range of results to take. So we'll look at that in more detail in a second. The fourth thing is you need to think about the causes of error in your experiment and the potential risks involved and how to negate both of those. And also, finally, how you're going to reach a conclusion from your experiment. What are you going to take out of your experiment that allows you to judge whether your objective has been met? So let's address each of these things, and then at the end I'll go through a worked example of this. Okay, so your variables. So there are three key variables that you need to know about. First, you should know about already, it's in key stage 3 and GCSE and that kind of thing, your independent variable. It's a variable that you change during your investigation. So quite often with electricity, what you do is you change your potential difference and then measure the current. So the thing you change would be the potential difference. So that would be your independent variable. Your dependent variable is the thing that you're measuring. So what something that's going to change because you change your independent variable. So very often with electricity, this is your current, or sometimes it's your resistance. It depends what kind of thing you're doing. So if you're doing an IV curve investigation, what you do is you change the potential difference, and you measure what happens to the current on it. So the current would be your dependent variable. The third kind of variable are your control variables. So they're the things that you're going to keep the same in your experiment. Now at GCSE, you might have got away with saying something like closing the window to make sure there's no wind or some rubbish like that. You need to think about specific things that could change the outcome of your experiment. So in a circuit, temperature has the ability to change the resistance of a component, and so that's something that needs to be controlled in that. And there are various strategies for doing that, which we'll look at in a second. Okay, so those are your three variables. Next thing is about selecting appropriate equipment. So because throughout the year 12 and year 13, you're going to come across a large array of equipment, you should be able to select the piece of equipment that you've used that's most appropriate for your investigation that you're doing. So with circuitry, there are essentially five key pieces of equipment that you need to know about and select the appropriate one. So you see here we've got two types of voltmeter. We've got a, just a standard voltmeter and we've got a millivoltmeter. And what you need to do is think about in your investigation what sort of scale potential differences am I going to be measuring? Because if they're greater than one volt, you should be using a standard voltmeter. If they're going to be smaller than one volt, you should be switching to use a milliameter to give you greater precision in your readings. And the same goes for the ammeter. Um, there's, you can either select an ammeter or a milliameter. So we don't use a milliameter at all, really, in GCSE. GCSE, year 12, 13, whatever, you wouldn't use one until you're doing microcircuitry. But you will use milliameters because some of the resistors that you'll be using are killer ohm, so you would expect to get small resistances. So this is something you would need to think about using. And the fifth one, which not a lot of people tend to know about, but is definitely available to you, is an ohm meter. And you can use it to measure the resistance of things. Um, but one problem with it is you can't use it while it's connecting a circuit. So if you've got a light bulb connecting a circuit, you can't just plug in your own meter and go, what's the resistance of this? You have to disconnect the light bulb from the circuit and then measure it by connecting your own meter. So that's a tool that is available to you. Okay, so those are your bits of electric equipment. Obviously, we've got things like power supplies and different kinds of variable resistor and that type of thing. Um, but these are the most common measuring instruments that you'll be using in your circuits type stuff, so those are the key ones to know about. Okay, 
selecting your range of results. So this is the bit most people tend to miss out. So they've said my independent variable is potential difference, but they don't say what values they're going to take with that to see the impact on the current. Okay, so if we look at, so say we're trying to identify a component using an IV characteristic. Now some of the things you'd expect to see for a diode is infinite resistance when the potential difference is negative and then negligible or sort of like reducing resistance as it goes positive. So in order to definitively prove that it was a diode, we would need both positive and negative potential difference readings. So that's something you need to think about when you're to doing your range of independent variables because it demonstrates that you know both of these properties of your diode. So that's the sort of thing you need to think about with the range of readings. The other thing you need to think about your reading readings is how you can increase the reliability and accuracy. So by taking repeat readings at the same potential difference, what you're able to do is demonstrate that your result is reliable because you should get the same result again and again and again when you're using the same potential difference. So that shows you've got reliable results. And one of the other things repeat readings are good for is you can in improve your accuracy. So by calculating the average of all of your different repeat readings, you can actually remove something called random error. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a video I'm making about errors. So by taking the average of repeat readings, you're actually reducing the random error in your results and thereby increasing the accuracy. And these are all things you need to think about when choosing what readings you should take. So giving both the range and the number of readings you're going to take. Okay, error reduction and safety. So first of all, an error is very difficult to eliminate. So we can never do an experiment where there's zero error in it. It just doesn't happen. So what we need to do is think about ways we can minimize their impact. So one of the things you should know is that the temperature can increase the resistance of a component. So if you leave the current running and the resistor gets hot, its resistance is going to change. So we need to think about ways of minimizing that effect. So what we do in circuits is we include a switch in a circuit to turn the current off between readings, which minimizes that effect. So that's one strategy, and we'll look at some other errors in my later video about errors in electric circuits. In terms of safety, um, with electricity there isn't too much to think about because the, the potential differences in the currents you'll be using will be low because of the components you're using. So you don't have to worry about electrocution and that type of thing. One thing you need to consider is if you're involving water at any point. So if you're working in a lab, there are often taps around. If you're using thermistors, we often put them in water. Again, something we're thinking about and you might need to think about waterproofing various components using plastic bags that kind of thing okay and the last part again something people always seem to forget how do we know if we've been successful in the experiment so the first thing you should always be doing with any kind of experiment you're working towards drawing a graph a graph with your independent variable on the x-axis and your dependent variable on the y-axis Okay, so in the case of an IV curve, you'd have I on the y-axis and V on the x-axis. That's why it's called an IV curve. And what you need to do is say what you're looking for in that graph. So if you're asked to test whether something's an ohmic conductor, you'd expect to see that graph being a straight line part of constant gradient passing through the origin, which demonstrates it's directly proportional and shows it's an ohmic conductor. So that's how you're explaining how you use your graph to get to see whether you've met your objective. So that's a lot of stuff, and I'm going to show you how this all gets put together to have a pretty concrete and thorough design for your experiment, which is on the next one. So let's go through. So let's have a look through what we've got here. First key thing, whenever you design an experiment, we do with electricity circuit diagram. It's so much easier to explain how you're organizing things if you use a circuit diagram. So even if it's a longer written answer type question, draw a diagram. It's so much more clear. Okay, so we've got a diagram. So we're looking at whether a conductor is an ohmic one. So what we're going to look to do is plot a graph of I against V 
and then we're going to see if it's ohmic from that. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the potential difference across your component, which is your independent variable. So we've identified our independent variable. We're going to measure the current passing through the component. That's our dependent variable. We're going to explain how we're going to measure each of those things. So we've explained that we've got a voltmeter in parallel with the component and a ammeter in series, and being nice and specific here, saying where they're going to be, so in series or in parallel. That's the level of detail we're looking for. Then to make it a valid experiment, we're going to get seven different independent variable readings. Fewer than that, you don't have enough evidence. Science is all about evidence. You've got more than seven readings, you've got quite a bit of evidence there. We're going to do it between minus 3 volts and 3 volts, so we've got both positive and negative readings. So we can look at making the distinction between a diode, for instance, and an ohmic conductor, or a light bulb and a conductor. It should be a straight line in the both positive and the negative regions. Then what we're doing, we're taking repeat readings to ensure our results are reliable. Again, a key thing to be thinking about in your experiment design. Then we're thinking about taking averages of the current readings that we're obtaining. So we're trying to improve our accuracy by removing random error. So we're being nice and specific. We're saying what we're doing and why we're doing it. We're looking at source of error here. So we're looking at the impact of temperature on the resistance and explaining what we're doing to try and negate that. So we're including a switch there and explaining why we're doing that. The last part here. We're talking about the graph that we're going to plot, being nice and specific what's on each of the axes. And then what we would be looking for if it is an ohmic conductor. So we're expecting a directly proportional relationship, which means the graph should be a straight line passing through the origin. And both of those criteria are required to be a directly proportional relationship to be an ohmic conductor. So I hope that's nice and clear. Feel free to post on this video if you have any questions or improvements on this design. But that's a pretty concrete design for carrying out this experiment and from that you would be able to carry out this investigation.